give our worship team a hand? I appreciate very much the effort and the time that they put into that, and I'm excited to be here this morning. Are you excited to be here this morning? Yes. I notice one thing. When I watch myself on television, sometimes I do to see what it sounds like, and sometimes I think it's great. Sometimes I'm like, oh boy, I need help. I notice I always tend to look to one side more often than another. So if I keep looking to one side, just why don't you all stand up and then I'll get the hint. No, probably that won't probably work, will it? There's a bunch of things that are right now going through my mind this morning. I had something prepared and I'm not sure if I'm going to go down that road. So Sam, if you can work with me, I might just go a whole different course if that's okay. Don't throw anything up there from me. Um, if you do, throw it really light so you hit the crowd, not me. <laughs> Why is it so often that attitude has so much to do with life in general? You've never noticed that in your life? Our attitude has so much to do with where we go in life. I think I mentioned it a while ago. I heard a message many, many years ago uh, by Casey Treat, and, and he preached a message that attitude determines altitude. And I think I've mentioned that before, but the reality of our attitude plays so much into what we do. We can get up in the morning, we can have a great attitude, an attitude that we're ready to take on the world, we're excited for the day, we're looking forward to the things that are ahead, but yet we can turn around the same time, the very next day, everything can be the same, even the weather can be unchanged. And yet our attitude all of a sudden shifts and we're going to feel like we're going to have a terrible day. Everything is going to be upside down. And it's amazing. I don't know about you, but when I look at myself, it's amazing that when I have an attitude like that, where everything's going to fall apart, nothing's going to work, it's amazing how that in fact happens. You get up in the morning and the coffee doesn't turn on properly and then the TV doesn't turn on and then this doesn't happen. And see, I knew this was the kind of day it was and I haven't gone to work yet. Then we go to work and then we have problems there in situations. It's amazing how our attitude can affect what we do. It's interesting in Philippians chapter 2, um, Paul, who, who's, who's like a pastor to that church, the, 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 the book of Philippians was written to a church at Philippi. And it's interesting, Paul addresses a lot of things that a pastor would to his congregation. And the amazing thing about it is, there's so much good truth in Philippians that we can apply to our own life, because I believe that it's not just written to them, but rather written to us as well, because whenever God speaks, it's always relevant for us. Whenever God speaks, it's always relevant for us. And it's interesting, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul says something there that, that really hits the heart of the matter. In Philippians chapter 2, he's writing to a group of Christians that have, some have known God for many, many years and, and, and really grasped onto the truth of Scripture and things of God. And then there's those that didn't, know, that didn't just know that much about God. They were so new to all this thing. So Paul was writing to a, a vast audience. And sometimes it's good to hear truth over again, even though we've heard it once before. I don't know about you, but sometimes... I easily forget things. I don't know if, if you're like me. I tend to forget. I, I'm a, sometimes I can forget my one name. What was my name again? Oh, yeah, that's right, George. I mean, Jeff, yes. So forgetful with things. It's amazing how I can have a pair of my car keys in my hand, and I'll be walking around the house looking for my keys and wondering where I put them. And my wife says, they're in your hand. Oh, I knew that all along. I was just testing to see if you are paying attention. See, we, we just forget so easy. And, and why I want to talk about attitude, because I want to tell you from honestly, attitude plays a huge role in my outlook at life. Attitude plays a huge role in how I approach life. Attitude has a huge role to play in how I react to people that react to me. Attitude has a huge uh, play when, when, when things are going well or when things are going bad or when I'm counting, especially when I'm counting on something. Man, I'm counting on something and that something doesn't turn out the way I want to. It's amazing how attitude plays such a key role in that. Am I just talking to myself here this morning or do you, can you relate to what I'm saying? Two or three of you, that's good. You're normal. The rest of you are exceptional. In Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 1, Paul gives a lot of different instructions and and I just want to read some of the different things he says because they're good things to hear and good things to, to have our ears attuned to. But I want to focus on one verse, and that's a little further down. Starting in Philippians chapter 2, starting with 1, he says this. 
Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? In other words, is there anything worth being encouraged about now that you know Jesus? Any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit, are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. Now, before I go any further, I want to tell you, just because you and I don't agree on everything doesn't mean we can still go the same direction. See, sometimes there's a misconception of unity. We sacrifice unity by twisting people's arms to think and act like we do. I'm telling you, that's not unity. Unity is in the midst of our differences. We can still get along and toe the line in the direction we need to go. That's what's so unique about it, because if we would take a survey here, the amount of people that are here, and, and we could just do a survey about certain subjects, and we'd have a vast difference on what that subject, how important it is, or where we need to go with things. It would be a tremendous difference all across this building. Unity takes that in consideration. Understanding we're different, but we're still committed to pulling in the same direction. That's the power of unity. He says, if they're make, my, make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, that doesn't mean we all have the same opinion. But rather, we're wholeheartedly in agreement, we need to still accomplish what we need to accomplish. See, it makes a difference. And he says, with each other, loving one another and working with one mind and purpose. Then he goes on and says this in verse 3. He says, don't be selfish. He's writing to a church. You think that they would have all the answers. Amen? Don't be selfish. Don't, and then he goes this, don't try to impress others. I mean, why not? It's so much fun. It gets you popular, right? Don't try to, imp- he's, he's talking to people that know things, right? He's, don't impress others. And then he says, be humble. And then he says, think of others better than yourself. I mean, that would end a lot of fights right there, amen? Right there would cause a little shift in everything. But if everybody would just think like I do, then it would be, everybody would be on the same page. Don't look at your own interests, he says, verse 4, but take the interest of others also. This is just practical stuff he's writing. This is just practical stuff, like don't be selfish, don't try to impress other people. Do you know what? When we impress other people, we often do it at the expense of other people. You ever notice that? We want to impress someone, so we have to tell someone what they're doing wrong. Or we highlight someone's weaknesses to make sure our weaknesses don't get, seem to be as prevalent and, and a little higher. He challenges the church not to be like that. Don't impress other people. Be humble. Think of others better than yourselves. Don't look only into your own interests, but also take interests of others too. And then verse 5 is where I want to park ourselves. It says this. You need to have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. You know, it's interesting he puts it there at the last. Because usually, I would think he would put that at the first. Because he would give the statement, let's have the same attitude. I want you to have the same attitude as Jesus. And then he starts listing these things. Don't do this, you know, watch out here, consider other people and, and work together and be, don't be selfish. But rather he puts that on the end. It's amazing why he does that because oftentimes, I don't know if you're like me, but when I read the scriptures, often I read with the wrong motive or intention in mind. Sometimes I can read a passage like this and go, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, and don't even do that. Can I ask you a question? How much life is when you, all you're told is what you can't do? Take you back when you were a teenager. Your parents told you, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Don't. What happened? You try them all. Don't do this, don't do that, don't. Okay, then I'll try it. It's like almost like we're built that way. It's almost like you give us the boundaries so we know where to push them. 
You see, and oftentimes we can look at God that way, and often we can read the Bible that way. Many times religious people take the word of God, and that's exactly how they portray it. If you do this and do this and do this and do this, then God's impressed with you and everything will be okay. When really God is more interested in what's on the inside, the heart of the matter. I want to tell you this. Whenever God speaks, whenever the word of God is presented, it's always to give life. Always to give life. So if we read this simply with a mindset of don't do anything, I don't know about you, but I'll be discouraged because sometimes I'm selfish, sometimes I like to impress other people, sometimes I'm not very humble, sometimes I think of myself better than other people because I don't have nearly the problems they do, and if they would only think like me, it'd be different. I, don't, I will look at my own interests because I want to protect myself of hurt and pain and disappointment. I, I, I don't want to look at the interests of other people because then I have to sacrifice mine. See, it's backwards. Monique did a great job, I want to tell you, last Sunday speaking about flipping tables and how Jesus was just so good at taking something that people valued and thought was so important and he would just flip it. I don't know about you, but I think what's happening is here is Paul is wanting the church to live a flip life. Because it's only human nature to want to look after yourself. I get into a big crowd of people, and I've been in crowds most of my life, and I'm I'm pastoring, I've had many different stages all across the country and in, in the United States and things like that. I've been in many different settings, but it's interesting, soon as I'm with a lot of people, a lot of my insecurities start coming up. Oh, is my shirt buttoned up? Is this done? Is this done? Is that right? Is, um, how am I going to start this? Are they going to really listen to me? Are, am I going to say something makes sense? And all these things are running through my mind many times before I speak because I want to do a well job. Does that make sense? Or job well? I can tell you I skipped too many English, but that's... <laughs> if you're a teacher, I feel sorry for you. You would not me want me one. You would not me, want me one of your students. And most of the teachers here are saying, thank God he's done school. I don't have to mark his grammar. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> you got me off on school and right there my mind left. You know what? My mom and dad watch me, so I have to be very careful. But if I would tell them how many times I skipped school when they thought I was biking to school, mm-mm. we already prearranged with a bunch of friends of ours that we would all agree together that we'd tell our moms we're biking to school, and we did bike, but we went somewhere else for the day. And we just had to make sure to watch our clock. We figured it took us probably about half an hour to bike home, so. If school's done at 3.30, then we need to start biking around 3.30 to make it home so that just everything would seem fine, right? So that's, you get the brunt end of my lack of educational skills. But that's okay. I would have never guessed God would have picked me to preach anyway, and so if you have any issues, you have him to blame for that. So <laughs> Many times, I better roll this in or we're going to really go on a rabbit trail here. What I want to say is, attitude plays a tremendous role in even how we hear and experience Jesus. If we think Jesus is out to rob us of joy and demand us to toe the line and come into play and you listen to what I have to say, that attitude gets carried in how we live for him. So when we have an attitude that God wants us to toe the line and come under, uh, you know, under his rulership and do what he asks us to do, we start having the attitude when we read scripture, we read into things that God never intended for them to be there. And I think that's why Jesus had so much trouble with the religious leaders and the Pharisees was because they had an attitude that their understanding and their actions were what meant the most. And Jesus came and turned those tables and said, that's not what matters. What matters is your heart and your relationship with the Father. Everything boils down to your relationships. When those relationships are are strained and those relationships are not, we try our hardest 
to obtain something in the flesh that only God can mend. And I want to tell you, when God is alive in your life, the least of our worries are the things outside of us because I'm telling you, your relationship with God will overflow into everything else you do. And it doesn't become work. It becomes an overflow of my relationship with God. And so often when our attitudes are wrong, we become work-oriented. We try harder. We do more. Oh, man, we have to, we got to do this, and we got to do that, and we got to do that. And what happens is when we have that kind of attitude, we carry that with us, and people get a wrong picture of who Jesus is. I want to tell you, God's about giving life in everything we do. If you're a mechanic, God is into giving you life doing what you're doing as a mechanic. If you're a teacher, God bless you. He wants to give you, to have an attitude to do it the best of the ability you can to give life. No matter what we do, we can choose by our attitude what we're going to do. Does that make sense? And so by giving the list of things, we can look at it from a perspective of we need to do more. Well, you've got to be this, you've got to be that, you've got to be this, you've got to be that. I would get in trouble in the church growing up. I tell you, I'd get in trouble all the time because I'd always ask why. Why are you doing it that way? Why do they think that way? Why are they acting that way? And sometimes people would say, you ask too many questions, just toe the line. And that happened to me for so many years in the church growing up that I began to think that's how God acted Quit asking so much questions and toe the line. When really God enjoys us asking questions because when we ask questions, that means we want relationship. I want to tell you this this morning. God is never offended by the questions that we ask. Him. Even in the most difficult of circumstances, he's never offended at the questions we ask. He never is. Because he's interested in relationship. After these lists of things, and now I want us to read it before we go into verse 5 again with a perspective of giving life. So God wants to breathe life into us and he wants us to carry his life wherever we go. So with that in mind, he says, if there's any encouragement, if there's any encouragement from belonging to Christ... Is there anything that gets you rolling and excited? If there's any comfort in, from his love, if there's any fellowship together in the spirit, your hearts are tender and compassionate, then make my joy complete by wholeheartedly agreeing with each other. Do you know that with everything that we disagree, there probably is always something that we do agree. We just have to take the time to find that and not be threatened by when someone thinks different than we are. Love one another, working together with one one purpose. And he says, don't be selfish. Oh, why would you want to when you're filled with life? Why would you want to? You fill up gas and you're filled with life and you just give it over to the person that's pumping gas. You're, you're, just, you're not thinking of yourself. You're, you're thinking of other people. You're just, it's just natural. Don't impress others. Because when you're full of life, you're interested in others being full of life too. Then you think of their well-being, you think of their context, and you want to give them life. I want to tell you, the world is full of darkness and emptiness and heaviness, and we have an answer to change that because the life in us will influence that. Oh, let's go on here. So don't be, why would you want to? Don't impress others. I don't, I want to think of others better than yourself. I value, when you value people more than anything else, you want to see them exalted rather than yourself. It's just natural. It's, it's giving of life. Be humble. We have nothing to gloat around with. We are products of God's grace. We're products of his mercy. And then he says, think of others better than yourselves. Well, because it just overflows. Don't look out for your own interests, but take interests of others too. It's just giving life. It's exciting when life. How many are attracted when people give you life? There are many times that people don't give us life. They comment about maybe a weakness we have or something that we haven't done correctly or a problem that we're going through, and they remind us of that. And what does that do to us? It sucks the life out of us. But when you're in the midst of your struggle, midst of your difficulty, midst of your confusion, midst of your pain and your hurt and all kinds of other stuff, and someone speaks life to you, it almost, it starts giving you energy. It's like the problem isn't as big as what I recognize it as. That's the power of life. 
Don't only look for your own interest, but take others' interests in focus as well. And then verse 5, have the same attitude that Jesus had. It's almost like, I'm going to sum it all up for you, church. And it sums up this way. Have the same attitude that Jesus had. And nothing will be an issue. I want to tell you this. I want to tell you this. He writes and says to have the same attitude that Jesus had. I want to tell you it is possible. It is possible. Jesus would never ask something of us that we can't accomplish with his power. Everything. Matthew chapter 6. Again, Jesus is so good at flipping tables. You know what? I'm, I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 5. I have it up there. I think it would be good to bring Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 44, is, is, is an example of how our attitude can shift people's lives. In Matthew chapter 5, and starting in verse 44, it has these words. Can you bring that up there for a second? But I say, that Jesus is speaking here. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies. Love your enemies. And then he says, bless those who curse you. And do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. It's interesting the word says spiteful, because sometimes we can be spiteful. We purpose it. He says, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And then he says in verse 45, in that way, you'll be acting as two children of the Father in heaven. He turned the table. Well, I want justice. But he tells us. He gives us instruction to love our enemy. Can you put it up there once more? Look at the wording used again. It's powerful stuff of how he changes. When our attitude is different, what happens? But I say to you, see, when our attitude is correct and life is flowing for us, he says, love your enemies. It's possible. Yeah. I want to tell you, it's possible. It's not something that we have to strive for, hard work hard for, walk Back and forth in a room, man, i got to love this guy, i got to love this gal. I just like to punch their lights out sometimes. Sometimes it's so much fun doing it, but man alive after, it's not fun. It's, it's, it's the, the moment of, whew, I just, whew, I felt good. It's like, oh boy, now what do I do, right? Love your enemies. Pray for those. Bless those. That is totally opposite than what I'm feeling inside. But when my attitude is different, all of a sudden I look at the situation differently and I can approach it from a different angle. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? And he says that in verse, the last four, in that way you are acting as true children of God. That's having the attitude of Jesus. There's another one here. Matthew chapter 7 and starting in verse 12. This is, a, this is one that we often use when we're misbehaving growing up, especially if you grew up in the church, and if you didn't, God bless you because you didn't have to deal with this on a regular basis. It says this, do to others what you would have them do to you. Do to others what you... That, that's, that's flipping it again. It's amazing how our attitude can change the course of our life. So... I get cut off in traffic, and the first thing I want to do is pull up alongside and roll down the window and let them know that I'm not very happy, if you know what I mean. I've done that, been there, embarrassed myself, embarrassed my family. Come on, let's be honest, right? We've all, at least you felt that way. See, some of you feel that way. Well, what fun is just feeling when you don't do anything about it? So I just do something about it, right? Do to others what you would have them do to you. Hmm. Does it change? Does it change? It's amazing what our attitude can do. I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 18. I didn't know I was going to go down here, but I'm going to go down there anyway. Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse 21. Interesting situation here. 
See, the disciples were learning from Jesus, and they were picking up on some stuff. And so one of the disciples came to Jesus one time while they were just going around doing life and said, and, and I'll, I'll just read it. I'll just read it. Starting verse 21, it says, Then Peter came to him, who's Jesus. Peter came to Jesus. Peter's one of Jesus' followers. And he asked him, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? How often should I forgive someone that has done something to me? And I know Peter's heart was, he wanted to do right, so he's just asking Jesus. And, and then the verse tells us, he says, seven times? You have to get the heart of Peter. Peter was saying he was exaggerating what he thought would be the right thing to do. Hey, Jesus, does this impress you? When someone does something against me, how many times should we forgive them? Seven times? It's like, that's pushing the end seven times. That's like giving someone seven different opportunities where you've forgiven them. Like that's, I'm sure Peter would, was expecting Jesus to say, you know what, Peter? I love your exaggeration. I love the fact that you want to go above and beyond. That's, but what does Jesus say? Look what the verse says. Look what the verse says. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, no, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. You talk about flip the table there. It's like, that's not even close to what Peter thought was an exaggeration. Jesus took it and exploded it and said, no, you need to keep forgiving them every time they do something against you. You see, when we have the right attitude, that's something that will naturally happen. Because we want the next person's best interest in mind. Sometimes when we forgive someone, it may not release them from the circumstances, but it frees you from being bound and chained to those circumstances. And sometimes we have to learn to free ourselves because of what someone else has done to us. Amen? See, Jesus just takes Peter's Seven times, Lord, uh, seven times. And Jesus goes, no, not seven times. Pow! Seventy times seven. A religious person would take that in a calculator, and he would go, it is, I don't know what it is. How many got an iPhone here? What is 70 times seven? Someone help me out. Huh? 490 times. A religious person would say, okay. What's that? So 488 times, you got two more chances, buddy. Oh, great, 489 times, I forgive you. 490, that's it. What was the point of Jesus? Flipping our mindsets with our attitude where we don't put an end to what we need to give. We don't put an end to what we need to give. Amazing how our attitude can switch. And let me just put this. This is a free one, okay? If you, if you gave this morning, this is free. This is not included in that. No, I'm just kidding. Come on. Just because we forgive someone doesn't mean it goes away. Sometimes you have misconception. I forgive them. Why is it right in front of me again? Forgiving is an attitude we carry. We carry. It can stare us in the face but my attitude already is made up. I don't hold that against them anymore. You know how hard that is to do? <laughs> 70 times 7? That's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. And I'm telling you, we can learn it, church. This is not an ideal. This is, this is something when Jesus produces his life in us, this is a natural thing. We're, we're just not going to be moved by other people's attitudes toward us. We're going to always walk free. And you know the amazing thing is? When you're free and you're around people that are bound, they don't like it. They want you bound too. And so they put the pressure on. Do you really going to take that from them again? You don't want to... Please, I'm not listening. I don't want to hear that. It's, it's finished. It's done. It's over with. John 8... There's another one in John 8. John 8, starting in verse 10. John 8, verse 10, where we bingo. Here, Jesus found himself in a real circumstance. The religious people caught someone that was in the midst of an adulterous thing. 
And they figure, whoo, hoo, hoo. And Jesus got brought in and uh, watched all the accusations. Talk about flipping tables, okay? The law required her to be punished. What does Jesus add to? He always gives life. Always gives life. So he goes in verse 10. He starts writing in the sand, and every time he writes in the sand, and no one knows what he wrote because we weren't there as he wrote in the sand. We can assume we can put a lot of things into place. And I, I would think he was writing things down that those accusers had a problem with. And as soon as they had, this is my, my take, okay? It's not Bible. I'm just saying this kind of makes sense to me because that's how my mind works. If you struggle with hatred, and you're about judging somebody else what they've done, and Jesus goes and writes hatred on there. What is that going to do? <clears throat> and so as Jesus wrote in the sand, one by one, all the accusers started leaving. He just wrote in the sand. I don't know what he wrote, but I'm thinking he wrote some of their weaknesses, the things that they had trouble overcoming, because they were highlighting this woman's weakness. He was writing in the sand. One by one they left. And they all left. And then in verse 10, then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, listen to that, said to the woman, where are your accusers? Now listen carefully to what Jesus is saying there. By him making that statement, he's saying, I'm not one of them. I'm not one of them. Where are your accusers? What does the verse say? Let's bring it up again. Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And then Jesus said, neither do I go and sin no more. The word sin is a scary word to people because it's like, ooh. You know what sin is? It's simply missing the mark. That's what it is. It's just missing the mark. And when Jesus comes into our life, he directs us so we don't miss the mark anymore. We, we hit it right on target. Neither do I condemn you. He flipped the table. You see, the Pharisees and the religious leaders thought Jesus would take up their cause and go, that's right. And Jesus flips the table and he gives life to a situation that seemed to be birthing death. He gives life. He gives life. He gives life. There's one last one I want to, I want to read, and it's Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Romans 8 and 28. When I was a little kid in Sunday school... And I went to clubs and all these other things my parents, excuse my, made me go to. Hey, they were doing what was best, they thought. I don't think forcing our kids to do anything is in their best interest. But that's okay, we can still guide and whatever else. But I was, I had no choice in the matter. I had to take all these things, which is okay. But there was one verse I remembered in Romans 8, 28. And we had to memorize it all the time. I had no idea what it meant. I had no idea what it even referred to. It was just something I had to memorize, and that's often how things roll in the church, is we just have to memorize it, and it's good enough, and we don't know explanation anything. But it's interesting. Now that I'm older and understanding, it's pretty amazing passage of Scripture. Romans 8 and verse 28, and it says these words, And we know, there's no question here he's saying, and we know there's no no debate. We, we just know. When you know something, it doesn't matter what people tell you. When you know it, it's just, it doesn't change your opinion, right? Like someone can say, yeah, that Jeff, yeah, he's a communist. Well, you know that I'm not. At least I hope you don't. You would argue, no, he's not. I know him. He's never talked like that. He never thinks that way. Are you out of your mind? I know him. That's the knowing here. He says, and we know. It's a certainty. It's not a, well, I'm working through it. I know. I know. I know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. He knows. Talk about flipping the table again. You have a tragedy in your life. I want to tell you, God does not orchestrate that tragedy. That's a false 
misunderstanding and misrepresentation that the church is good at presenting to the world many times is when you're bad, guess what? Bad things are going to happen to you. And this is going to have God's going to wake you up and get your attention. And he's going to give you disease and cancer and sickness. And he's going to cause reckless in your life. No. He's the author of life. But what this verse is saying with certainty, that when we go through difficulties, when we find ourselves in the circumstances that we wish we could back out of and we can't, that God is big enough and able in those circumstances to turn what was bad into good. And he says, and we know. Hey, we're not debating that. We know. But I want to tell you this morning, if you don't know that, you're going to struggle with it. When you don't know that in here. You see, we can know things here. But it's knowing things in here that change our life. In here, it makes us sarcastic. It makes us a know-it-all. It makes us to want to answer questions, everybody. It makes... Knowing here, we can give a lot of information. We can impress people by what we say and what we come up with and how we can articulate things. But it's in here that transforms your life and those around you. I remember one preacher saying, um, there's 18 inches, uh, how did he put it? There's 18 inches from knowing something and experiencing them, 18 inches, and that's probably from here to here. Some of you are shorter as 12, some of you are really short as 6. You get the point. Sometimes we can be so filled with knowing here. That we can answer any question that there is. We can have any answer. We can solve any problem. It's like, and it looks so impressive. But really, it's short-lived because it never leaves an impact on people's lives. I, I went to school. I did. I even graduated grade 12, and, I, and they didn't push me through. I, I did pass. Barely, but I did pass. And I'm sure someone said, if we don't, he's going to be back next year, so... <laughs> Great, 78%. Wow, I didn't even study. Good for you. High five. Move along. <laughs> when it happens here, it changes everything. That's why the power of the attitude is so great. Because when our attitude changes here, when we have attitude here, when it goes 18 inches or whatever distance between the top to the heart, it impacts your life. Paul says, I know, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good. It's only God that's able to do that. We can't. We can't take a messy situation and, and orchestrate it. We try, though I've tried. I've tried to swindle and twist arms and beg and plead and manipulate all kinds of things, but it doesn't work. When I learned to let go, I still have to learn to let go, church. I still got to learn. There's things that I hang on with both hands. You know what I mean with both hands? Like it's so gripped that your knuckles are white that I'm hanging on so tight. Right. And there's some things that are, that are just no problem. But when God gets a hold of it in our life, yeah. he steps into our circumstances and he sees things from vantage points that we never see. Yeah. And we know, if we know here, then we're never, we're never like that. Because there's a knowing in here. I don't know how. I don't know how or the means or what. But I can rest because I know. And I know that he's going to step into the situation. And I'm going to watch him work. And what seemed to be the greatest obstacle in my life all of a sudden becomes the greatest opportunity that ever has come along my way. And I want to tell you this morning that Jesus is a master of making stairs out of the most hardest materials that are in our life. He's a master at switching things and moving things in our life that was an obstacle becomes opportunity. What becomes a roadblock becomes a stepping stone. What becomes a, a lack of understanding all of a sudden becomes a wealth of knowledge and information. God is able to give us wisdom in situations to handle whatever we have come along our way. And I want to encourage you this morning. 
Just like Monique so craftedly and so excellently put it last Sunday, when Jesus steps in, he will always challenge the status quo. And our status quo usually is always our mindset. And when he turns that upside down, we have a choice to make. We can either be threatened and run, or we can embrace it and accept it and learn from it. I don't want my fear to hold me back. I want my fear to be conquered so that I'm able to keep moving forward even though it looks, might look scary. Because I know at the end of the day, he always has life and purpose in our life. Always. If it doesn't give life, it's not from him. If it doesn't give me hope, it's not from him. If it doesn't give me perspective of feeling joy and excitement and thrill and anticipation, it's not from him. God never uses events in our life to remind us, hey, wake up. Never. He always uses life aspects. He shows us who we are. He speaks to us truth. And all of a sudden, it changes our perspective. And our attitude, when it's way off here, comes in the line here. Attitude will always determine altitude. Did I make sense this morning? Yeah. Let's just pray together.